Good evening, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project Magnetic Reversal News and Shinrin Yoku, bringing you a grand solar minimum update Friday, May 21st, 9 p.m. Mountain Time, 2021. The models are in. Heavy snow will continue through June in the West. But a secondary story picking up speed. China hit with two earthquakes in one single night. Rescue operations underway after the one-two punch. High six mag, seven magnitude, boom, boom in China. The big story tonight, snow. Unusual May snowstorm could be a preview of what's to come. All that, and we're asking you to keep calm because it is boom time. Let's talk about the May snowstorm, the record-breaking temperatures, and cold. Winter storm warnings and winter weather advisories were in effect early Friday morning across western Montana and northern Idaho. And the Montana Department of Transportation reported severe driving conditions on Route 3. Sign of the times. U.S. Highway 20 north of Island Park closed due to snow and road blockages. Heads up, Idaho. It's just getting started. Spring snow covers Bozeman, Montana. Another round of wet on the way. Hey, hey, snowfall fast and furious on Colorado's most dangerous highway. Winter weather advisories issued and people, well, they couldn't drive on the road. <laughs> Storm produces record snow and cold. This guy is so blurry, we can't even bring him to you. Now let's take a look at the record-breaking snow and cold. What a storm. Record snow fell with record cold temperatures supporting the frozen precipitation. Up to two feet accumulated in the mountains. And there were record cold high and low temperatures for much of the state of Montana. Hello. Total precipitation amounts have ranged from as little as 0.3 inches to as much as two inches of liquid equivalent, which is 24 plus inches of snow. Ho, ho, ho. Some rainfall totals in northeast Montana exceeded 1.5 inches. And all of this precipitation has put a dent in the drought, not just in Montana, but half of Colorado is out of the drought as well. More precipitation coming in the next 48 hours for all of the West. And there was even precipitation in Arizona that wasn't even on the models or the map. So we're getting wet. We're moistening up here. The drought is not over, but neither is the precipitation as another big storm is headed towards Montana. Big sky country. Sierra Nevada gets a late dusting of snow after an extremely dry winter. Nevada picking up on the moisture, even if it is the global warming goodness version. Here you can see I-80 at Castle Peak. Shut up, Al! He said he was in Vegas and it was 110. Get in your hole! No bunt cake. It's that simple. Wet weekend ahead, including heavy mountain snow on Sunday. That will be your fun day. Jesus, Louises, this is Wyoming. Everybody's picking up on the fun. Rain is falling across Teton County on Friday and will continue throughout the afternoon and evening thanks to a southerly flow of subtropical moisture that's going to keep us moist and warm tonight. Along with an extra boost from the jet stream, despite the cooler temperatures, there is a chance we could see an embedded thunderstorm on Friday afternoon as well up in Wyoming. But highs on Friday will top out in the 50s. And then it is downtown Leroy Brown. Teton County could be picking up a foot and a half in the coming 48 hours. We're going to get to the models. No drought in nearly half of Colorado. I already said that. While major drought continues in some regions. Well, good news is a map released by the United States Drought Monitor on Thursday shows much of Colorado is no longer under drought conditions. In fact, 48.2% of the state to be exact. I love it when a plan comes together. Leading the charge out of drought is cosmic rays and the grand solar minimum. Boom! To knowledge and science. Wow! Doesn't that feel good? Eight tornadoes confirmed near Twin Cities Metro, but little damage, thankfully. Hurricane forecasters tracking two disturbances ahead of the Atlantic hurricane season, but that means very little to these puppies. Number two and number one. Having fun out there in the Atlantic. Now, disturbance number two has a 50% chance of cyclone formation in 48 hours, but by then it will already be in East Texas or South Texas, the nexus of the Schmexus, however you want to look at it. The last place we need additional moisture. Now, disturbance number one is definitely going to become a cyclone. 
probably in the next 12 hours. And that's just going to move off towards Europe. And who cares about those guys? You know what I'm saying? Snowfall analysis from the last 48 hours shows that Montana has been smothered with two feet, foot and a half or a huge area in the red. And it is not over. Take a look. There's more falling in the same places. Another foot or more in southern Montana is going to be picking up while Wyoming is going to be picking up some heavy snow. Central Idaho will be picking up more heavy snow. This is through Sunday. Here is Saturday, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. So by Sunday evening, another foot and a half, could be four feet, two to three feet in a lot of areas of the high elevations of Montana. As we head roll in towards June here, May 24th, we're going to be picking up another 16, 12 to 18 inches, potentially. Let's say 16 is a good average here for the Southwest Mountains. The central Sierra is picking up snow. Eastern Nevada in the high country picking up snow. And the triple junction of Nevada, Oregon, and California picking up snow. Ho, ho, ho. Take a look at the triple junction of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. That will be the crosshairs for the next major event. And there is another event at the end, the first week of June that we've been talking about that's still on the models. So we'll keep a close eye on that development. As we keep a close eye on flooding potential. Now here's the total precipitated accumulation through June 6th. And you can see that Eastern Iowa does not want to be in 12 to potentially 20 inches of rain over the coming two weeks. That it is very much a oh. mountain of mystery and it's inside of. We'll get to that. That's going to be a fun video coming up in just a second. Where the heck were we? Cyclone one and two who knew we're on the models in the total accumulated precipitation. Iowa's showing Iowa, Illinois state line there quad cities. Oh my goodness. Not looking good for you. I remember back in 1996, when the flood of the century was occurring, I went down here to document it as a geologist with my mentor, Pete Goodwin. We got some amazing footage from Davenport and the Quad Cities of the river literally 60 miles wide while it was flowing. Could be a repeat of the last cycle, but I would, well, I will digress. Tropical disturbance in the Gulf of Mexico, severe weather in the plains, a low in the Gulf of Mexico could produce heavy rainfall and exacerbate flooding over portions of southeastern Texas. We just showed you tropical depression number two. That's the one. It's going to be moving on shore in 12 to 16 hours, in my opinion. And southwest Louisiana and possibly becoming a short-lived tropical depression storm before moving inland over Texas coast. Thunderstorms capable of large hail damaging winds will be possible across parts of the central and southern high plains. Helmets are recommended. Where'd everybody go? There we are. That was a quick comeback. Two Chinese provinces hit by earthquakes with two reported not alive. Over 20,000 people evacuated in Qingdong in northwest. Yunnan in southwest struck on the same day. That's a lot of compass directions, especially during a magnetic reversal. China hit with two earthquakes in one night. One, two. Who knew? Three, four, Al Gore's. Well, you know how that rhymes. Rescue operations are underway in Yangbi in Yunnan. A 6.4 magnitude earthquake in Yangbi Yi Autonomous Country in southwest China's Yunnan province was followed by a 7.4 magnitude earthquake in the Queen's High China. As of 1.50 a.m. local time, one person has been reported dead, 18 people slightly injured, three people injured seriously following the 6.4 magnitude earthquake in Yangbi Yi Autonomous County in southwest China's Yunnan province. A total of 12,882 houses were damaged. How they were that specific when they don't know how many people are dead or injured is anyone's guess. But they certainly care about those homes. All 12,882 homes have now been placed on quarantine and are getting Band-Aids and Boo-Boo makeups. A total of authorities say road collapses and landslides from the Yunnan quake has cut some transportation lines to the epicenter, but electricity, telephone, and internet are still working until, oh, holy macaroni. Later, a 2 a.m. local time, 7.4 magnitude earthquake hits the Qinghai, China prefecture, or whatever they call it. The local government has sent special team 16 people to the earthquake area of Qinghai for emergency response because 16 people is just the perfect amount to help a billion people in China.
16. Just divide it. I mean, it's like 1.9 million per, per person. Seismic update. Here are the boomers. There's the big boomer. Holy tumor, 7.3. Coming after the initial shock of 6.1 in Dali. Dali, China followed to the north with the 7.3 in Qinghai. And we do have other significant quakes around the Ring of Fire. 6.5 and Tonga. No tsunami warning. So just things getting jiggy. Space weather. Ghost X-ray flux showing. We just hit a C5 flare moments ago. Could have triggered those one of those major earthquakes. I haven't overlaid the time scale yet. We could do that in five seconds, but that just hit me. So here's that C flare. Boom. We're now at 1% M flare, 25% C, and you can see that, well, we, we nailed that right on the head on the fourth flip. And we did come off of a coronal hole stream that produced a G5 geomagnetic storm for three hours, which was predicted by NOAA and NASA, only it came a little later than their prediction, and it amounted to nothing except a large coronal hole stream with a G5 magnetic storm which they did allude to. Glacier Peak is the second most active explosive volcano in the Cascades, and we've been warning you that the Cascades light up during cosmic ray maximums, which are called grand solar minimums. A grand solar minimum is a cosmic ray maximum, and that means it's boom time in the Cascades. 200 years ago, we had Mount Baker, Mount Glacier, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood, Mount Shasta and Lassen Peak all puffing and passing. But today's indoctrinated volcanologists don't even know this data set, which is up to 20 years old. Here, take a look. We're going to get you up to speed with what is going on in the Cascades, and we're going to watch a movie together. Get the popcorn ready. We'll be back in a few minutes. Mountain of mystery, and it's inside of Snohomish County. Now, I am at a park in... <coughs> Everett that has some elevation. They even have a display here showing what the Cascades look like in good weather. And out here beyond Mount Pilchuck is what you can see, a peekaboo shot of Glacier Peak. The eruption of Mount St. Helens was first and foremost a massive explosion, an explosion that blew off the top 1,300 feet of the volcano's height, sending ash 80,000 feet up into the air and into communities east of the Cascades. It's that capacity for an explosive eruption that brings us to Glacier Peak. So Glacier Peak is the second most active explosive volcano in the Cascades behind Mount St. Helens. But part of the risk is how many people are exposed to that, to the hazard of that potential eruption. Alexa Van Eaton is a physical volcanologist. Part of the risk is how many people are exposed to that, to the hazard of that potential eruption. Alexa Van Eaton is a physical volcanologist. Alexa Van Eaton is a physical volcanologist for the Cascades Volcano Observatory in Vancouver, Washington. Yes, Mount Rainier is considered the third most dangerous volcano in North America, in large part because it's much closer to bigger populations in Puyallup and Tacoma. But explosions and massive amounts of falling ash are just one major hazard. What happens to rapidly melting snow and ice that live on the top of the mountain? When that ice melts quickly in an eruption, it quickly forms devastating lahars. So, you know, those rivers flow towards Darrington and, and onward. So any, any lahar from Glacier Peak would be something we would be really concerned about. Van Eaton and her colleagues were back on Glacier Peak last fall for two weeks backpacking in the wilderness, trying to learn more about the mountain's eruptive tendencies, studying layers of ash and mud from previous eruptions for clues to timing. Just when was the last big explosion? But the other thing that we were able to tackle in a wonderful amount of detail is the younger eruptions from Glacier Peak, the stuff that's happened over the past 2,000 years and maybe even as young as 200 years ago. But scientists... 
Hold that thought. She just said as young as 200 years ago. And we've been reporting on that for five years. And she, this student has just gotten up to speed who is now actually has a top position at the USGS in the Northwest. This is who, this is who is running. She has just gotten up to speed with information that's been around for decades. Let's listen to her say it again. 2000 years and maybe even as young as 200 years ago. But scientists say they also need more real time monitoring of Glacier Peak. Right now, there is only one seismometer on the mountain and seismometers are necessary in order to pick up on tiny earthquakes that can show that magma deep inside the mountain is starting to move. And they're hoping they can get more seismometers up there in 2022. Can you believe how pathetic they are in the most volcanically active area with the most dangerous volcanoes in the world in North America? There is one seismometer that is pathetic. And the leading geologist, we just saw her, said that she has just become aware. For clues to time. She has just. So there she is. Where is she back at? Option. There she is. Alexa Van. Uh, she is just aware that there could be a possibility that this volcano erupted 200 years ago. Apparently, she never saw this graphic, which is a decade old. Absolutely stunning. All right, let's <laughs> mind blown. Now let's talk about the real seismic risks in Cascadia. Here we are at the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. The PNSN, I'll leave you links to this. And you can see Mount Rainier has been picking up activity, especially in the last few weeks. Take a look. Boom, 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 boom. This is earthquakes near the volcanoes. St. Helens has had a regular periodicity of puff, puffs, and passes. Mount Hood has had a couple sporadic uh, seismic activities recently. We also have the Sisters and Crater Lake. Now, Adams, Baker, Glacier Peak, Jefferson, and Newberry don't have this type of seismic activity. So it would be my prediction, which has always been the case in the last four years, that Rainier will be the first to erupt and then St. Helens and Glacier, followed by Baker and maybe Mono Lakes. So my predictions, you just got them. Seismic update, Kilauea Volcano, Lava Lake almost fully crusted and soon it will be busted through by the lava. <laughs> or there will be a caldera collapse and a massive eruption, the scale of which humanity has not seen. Now let's look at the rest of the volcanoes worldwide. We have Semaru, Sangue, Navados de Chilan, Navados de Ruiz. And Semaru is puffing to 14,000 feet, Sangue to 20,000. Navados de Chilan is difficult to detect, so why are we talking about it? Navados de Ruiz puffed to 19,000 feet. And we also have Stromboli, Fuego, Semaru, Tucono, Reventador. Now Stromboli, the lava flow on the Sierra de Foco remains active. And they can go for themselves, according to me. According to the latest information from Ingva Catinia. It is still well, it is still well elemented, although it is active front has receded, whatever the, that means. We also have Fuego to 16,000 feet, Suanos Himo puffing in, Sabancaya to 26,000, Liwotol, whoever, and look at these fantastic clouds here in the sat image, moving 7,000 feet to the north, right towards the equator. Now, we have a collection of scientific papers which have come out in the last few days about micro tectites tectites and elongated tectites multi-collector argon 40 and argon 39 dating of micro tectites from the trans antarctic mountains in antarctica have shown that the dating of these objects are quite recent less than a million years old but the problems with dating shows that they could be much sooner. So if it's 0.8 million, it all could also be 80,000 years. So these are recent catastrophic events coming from the cosmos affecting the earth. These micro tectites are thought to come from uh, cosmic catastrophes where close proximity objects hit like planets near another planet, blast off objects that land on that planet, could be comets discharging. It could also be micronovas or supernovas from locally oriented suns. 
All of those are the sources of these microtectites. But in recent papers, here we have another one, microtectites and glassy cosmic furals from new sites in the Transarctic Mountains of Antarctica. And this is related to the last paper. And we'll also come over here to geochemistry of aerodynamically distorted Australasian microtectites, implications for ejecta on Mars and Venus. This adds uh, evidence towards the electric universe theory over the Thunderbolts Bolts project of their... Uh, and also Velikovsky of planets in close proximity recently in human history. And what I mean by recently is in the last six to 12,000 years, all of the large gas giants and other planets like Jupiter, Mars, Venus, Mercury, all those planets were much, much closer to us and they've now moved into more stable orbital environments since these times. Now, the geochemistry of the distorted microtectites is mind-blowing. And some of these microtectites have been elongated to over a foot. But what I want you to bring in here is the region where these microtectites in Australia, Eurasia, whatever they call it, are found. And this is inside of this black dotted line. Most of Australia is in there. All of Indonesia is in there. And some of South China and India. So what this means is that the ejective material of microtectites hit this entire region. It's like a million square miles. It's unfathomable. And if you think this came from a comet impact, which they put here, possible crater location, you're just as deluded as the people putting crater locations when uh, events that occur, occur worldwide are localized because no one shares information globally. So the, the biggest problem in the last 30 years is that global scientists have been, not been corroborating data and information. It's only happened in the last decade. And this type of shit needs to stop because it's disinformation. Where over here in Australia, we have a, an impact site with a crater. But also all around the rest of the globe, there are other quote unquote impact sites with potential craters. It's all bullshit. We need to rethink our paradigm. Science is dead. And this is not science. This is like, to me at this point in my life, this is kindergarten bullshit, which wouldn't get past an undergraduate class with me as your instructor. I would say, get out of, get out of Dodge. Get the, out of my class. Kiss my ass. Now, Australian text, tectites, how old are the tectites? Well, all the tectites being studied that I just showed you in all these papers are between, wait for it, 35 million years old and to present. So that's the entire range, 35 million years to present. Now, what that encompasses is all the mountain building in the entire Rockies and all those events, including, including the largest supervolcano caldera, which is just 40 miles west and a little north of me, the La Garita Caldera, which eclipses the Yellowstone Caldera, but that also erupted in the same time frame. Around 24 to 30 million years ago, according to geology, things were very bad in North America and worldwide. But maybe that dating is a little off. Could it be? I was looking at the bones of great beasts. Astounding discovery made in California Valley just recently, the largest discovery of megafauna, and uh, this is a paleontological... It is very much a mountain of mystery. Shut up already. This is a paleontological mind boom. It's a mind fart. Now, as the drought lowers the, the, the river here, or the reservoir, I mean, we're getting exposed to some amazing petrified forests. It started with a single petrified tree, half buried in the mud of the... Mokulmi River watershed in the Sierra Nevada foothills. The, the site entry, Greg Frenick, a ranger at East Bay Municipality Utility District. He was walking the valley last summer. It wasn't a bummer. He inspected further, and what he discovered led to the most significant fossil discovery in California's history. Now, saying this sentence blows my mind because the most significant fossil discovery in California history were the La Brea tar pits, where Tens of thousands of, of mammalian fossils as well as other fossils were found 
in conservation lager stadt, perfect conservation where you could actually take the bones out and extract DNA. And the same thing is happening here. It's completely fantastical, only better. Petrified wood comes from trees that were buried in fine-grained sediments and deltas. Bullshit. It comes from electro, electrified sediment. Uh, it comes from electricity. And let me explain it. If you have a catastrophe that buries things that are biologically active, they're going to rot and not be there. But if you electrify it and exchange the carbon for the silica instantaneously, boom, you have instantaneous fossilization which I believe, based on all of the evidence I've seen in the last 30 years, is the case for conservation Lagerstadt. Conservat Lagerstadt is like the perfect conservation of these Ordovician fossils of soft body parts like Echinodermata and other soft, like sea snails and other things. So we have perfect preservation that's up to 400, 500 million years old. It's completely mind boggling. How is that possible? that something that soft could be in such a perfect environment anoxically to not decompose, to be perfectly preserved. Well, it's not possible. It's not. Not in the scale of conservation Lagerstadt fossils that we have. These are perfectly preserved fossils for different time frames. It would be impossible for that to be an accident. It has to be something more prevalent and regular like electricity that is burying these objects and fossilizing them almost instantaneously. That's my opinion, and I'm going to stick with it. Climate change, not human population growth, correlates with late quaternary megafauna declines in North America. Now, this paper, which is not a schmaper, just published in February 16th of this year, goes against that three-year hypothesis that the Clovis people hunted all the megafauna to extinction. The dumbest hypothesis ever predicted from academia received almost a billion dollars in funding. Thousands of students wrote thesis papers and their entire lives are ruined because it's total garbage. And why their advisors, and <laughs> I don't even know why faculty even exists, Science is dead. Geology departments, multidisciplinary uh, earth science departments, all garbage information coming out over the last three decades. Since I left academia, it's all garbage. It's all paid for and funded by mega corporations that now own the National Science Foundation and governments worldwide that are funding scientific papers to, to push policy. It's not to push science. It's not to gain more information. It's to get political supremacy to push your policy. It's totally disgusting, and I'm about to throw up. Now that I vomited, we could probably move on. It was actually just a dab, but I digress. Astronomers detect nickel in the coma of interstellar comet 21 Borisov to I Borisov. Now, the comet is Russian to begin with and named by them, so I'd be suspect. They have something to do with the internet or bots or putting uh, <laughs> yeah, Beijing Biden in office or something like that. But using spectroscopic observations, some low-level scientists figured out some top-level information well above all cosmologists worldwide. This is the nature of cosmology. It's like if you live in a basement or in the garage of your mother's home, you can do better work than people are funded billions of dollars at CERN. I know. Stay in your hole, Al. Yeah, so just like Al Gore made billions of dollars off a book that meant nothing but gobbledygook and that the natural climate variability has barely ro rose temperatures 1.5 C in, since 1880, Al Gore can suck it. And so can all of the other scientists in cosmology at CERN and worldwide that continued to work on the narrative that I need funding, I have to publish, so I'm going to publish bullshit. You guys are complete embarrassment to humanity, and I hope you all, well, I know you have a horrible life already, so I, I'm sorry for you. I'm praying for you. NASA traces sources of mysterious fast radio bursts sending signals to Earth, and they found it's coming from a galaxy that wasn't even formed until before the prior to the Big Bang. That's crazy. Don't panic, but cosmologists have no idea what's happening at all. 
But what we do know from disclosure is that there are extraterrestrials flying ships that are beyond our capability in the, the Earth's atmosphere every day for almost a decade, and we've just been told about it. Now, Alabama overturns the 1993 yoga ban. Can you believe a state actually banned yoga in the 1990s? This is the, the practice of stretching and meditating to become a better person. So hopefully Alabama goes from the bottom of the depths of the worst people on in North America and starts to rise up a little bit because they're now allowing uh, young people to stretch and to contemplate life and to take off their face panties already. Holy shit, more food production resources. This was sent to us from one of our most bizarre followers, I won't even mention his name because I don't know, know if he wants us to mention it, but he emails me regularly, 5, 10, 12 times a week for the last five years. And some his information is good, but he certainly loves Ice Age Farmer who has become more like uh, an alarmist schmucktard who is producing videos for money, and although he, he claims it's all truistic. Even though I'm making $10,000 a month on Google, please watch my videos. I love you. Who knew? Well, here's actual information that's coming from academia that's not been polluted. Or maybe it has been. This is Cornell Cal's College of Agricultural and Life Sciences. But what it is is a resource list that's updated regularly on anything you need to know about crops, crop growing, crop management, Field variety trials, field crops, high tunnels, management of potatoes, new vineyard timelines, small farms programs, organics at Cornell, organic production and organic production guides, permaculture online courses, reduced tillage vegetables, sustainable cropping, and vegetable growing guides for gardeners, vegetable pathology, vegetable varieties, weed ecology and management, and what's cropping up. So this is a higher end newsletter for the more experienced farmer. And I'm happy to bring it to you. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance in a dystopian world where, well, cryptocurrency has been tanked by China. And now is the time to buy. If you're not buying now, then you shouldn't buy any other time. I just said it. Sign of the times. Planning prevents piss poor performance. One-time donors, our Patreons, the people that share this video, you're all heroes. Proper prior planning prevents piss-poor performance in the dystopian world that you live in. The media is not going to give it to you. We've been stricken with the community guideline strike on magnetic reversal news for a video we put up a year ago. And I'm going to be doing an expose in the morning on that because we're sick of it. YouTube, you can go yourself according to diamond and i'm sure everyone else listening be safe we love you let's stick together i have multiple platforms bit shoot shit shoot this will upload in about three hours library rumble patreon steam it do it now do a dab yeah.